Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. For a time, she thought it might be a nightmare, born into her mind by the cold spring wind blowing off the high mountains. Wild-haired, savage-clawed, fangs bared, evil had emerged from the forests like the witches of local myth, marching from home to home, feeding on blood. Through the darkness, Vidya Devi watched as the psychopathic carnival unfolded slowly, without a single bullet fired, 22 children, women and men were slaughtered one by one. Their throats slid through. Seven who barricaded themselves in their home were burned alive. Two days after the April 1998 massacre, then Home Minister L.K. Advani and Chief Minister Farooq Abdullah flew in to survey the carnage in the hamlets of Pram Court and Dhakti Court. They discovered Vidya sitting catatonic amid piles of bodies. Local police, it turned out, had not yet completed the long march into the mountains. Almost certainly, the jihadists who killed 10 people last week near the Vaishno Devi Pilgrim Registration Centre at Shiv Kori withdrew northwest, intelligence officials say, passing the hamlets of Pran Court and Dhaki Court on their journey into the high altitude forests around Ghul and Gulabgad in Udhampur. Local jihadist Manzoor Ahmed, who guided the Pran Court killers to the hamlet, was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2003. The actual murderers, believed to have been Kader of the lashkar e taiba were never located. The perpetrators of dozens of similar communal massacres in Kashmir remain unidentified. Lashkar operative Muhammad Sohail Malik, who confessed to killing 36 Sikh residents of Chatti Singhpura, was acquitted for lack of evidence and repatriated to Pakistan in 2015. As assembly elections loom in Kashmir, the message delivered in Riyasi by Islamabad's Inter-Services Intelligence Directorate couldn't be clearer. From 2021 on, the lashkar e taiba and jaish e Mohammed have repeatedly demonstrated that they're capable of picking off Indian military personnel in ambushes while suffering almost no casualties of their own. Time to just minutes before Prime Minister Narendra Modi took office for the third time, the new Riyasi carnage is a message from the ISI, warning it can further step up the pain for India and Kashmir and inflict crippling political damage. Even as the Prime Minister paraded his hawkish credentials before the nation during the Lok Sabha campaign, reminding Pakistan he was willing to cross the line of control to attack terrorists and promising to make that country wear bangles, a less noticed polemic was emanating from across the line of control too. lashkar e taiba commanders held a commemoration rally for jihadist Abdul Wahab killed by the Indian army near Sopor. The martyrs are calling on us not to forget their sacrifice of blood, one poster advertising the rally read. Led by Kashmir region, jaish e Mohammed chief Masood Ilyas Kashmiri, not connected to the better known Al-Qaeda terrorist Muhammad Ilyas Kashmiri, hundreds of Kader also marched in Mirpur and other towns demanding an escalation of jihadist operations against India. Together with his commander Maulana Masood Azhar, Kashmiri is accused by the National Investigation Agency of organizing a 2022 attack targeting Modi on a visit to Kashmir. Earlier in the summer of 2022, the Jaish held its first public rally since the Pulwama crisis of 2019, when jihadists fired shot in the air in memory of slain terrorist Hafiz Arsalam. An audio tape of that rally, obtained by the print, shows Kashmiri claimed responsibility for a 2021 attack on police in Srinagar and called for financial donations to fund the purchase of assault rifles, which he said cost the organization over 7 lakh Pakistani rupees each. Flowers are being offered to the Mujahideen who are sacrificing their life and a millet silence is being observed here in their memory, Kashmiri said at the rally. 
in unusual public criticism of the Pakistan army. Yet, at the same time, our leaders are doing nothing to confront the Indian army. The Lashkar has also become increasingly open about its operations inside Kashmir. Following the assassination of senior Lashkar operative in Ravlakot, allegedly by Indian intelligence, the organization proclaimed it had killed three Indian soldiers in retaliation in an ambush near Kokarnak. Led by Lahore-based Sajid Jatt, the Lashkar's one-time chief for southern Kashmir, the terrorist group has succeeded in staging several high-profile attacks on Indian troops in recent months. Election time polemic might suggest the new government in Delhi will reach for its coercive toolkit to deter this terrorist revival. But in many ways, that's easier said than done. Late in the summer of 2018, if Sandar Ali Khan Patodi, a polo-paying aristocrat serving in the ISI, met his research and analysis wing counterpart at a top London hotel. Efforts by Prime Minister Modi to reach out to Islamabad had floundered, leading to Indian strikes across the line of control in Uri. The ISI had hit back, as scholar Manoj Joshi notes, with a series of savage Fedain attacks. The secret meeting was the outcome of efforts by Indian National Security Advisor Ajit Dover and Pakistan Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa to somehow put a lid on this tit for tat killing. The effort seemed to fall apart in 2019 after a bombing by the Jesh claimed the lives of 40 Central Reserve Police Force personnel in Pulwama. India hit back again across the line of control using its air power, bombing a Jesh seminary in Balakot. Islamabad used its own combat jets to retaliate, almost hitting the headquarters of the 19th Infantry Brigade in Rajori. Each Indian coercive effort since 2001-2002, the former commander of Pakistan's Mangla-based One Strike Corps, Lieutenant General Tariq Khan, explained, erode our position of deterring war through our nuclear capability. Thus, failing to challenge the Indian assault at Pulwama would lead Pakistan, and I quote, to become more and more vulnerable to an asymmetric conventional threat. The two countries backed off at the brink of full-scale war though, and the secret channel helped build a ceasefire on the line of control which came into force in February 2021. General Bajwa delivered on his promises to curb jihadist activity. The Jesh's chief, Masood Azhar, was moved into protective custody. The organization's Bhavalpur headquarters placed under government administration and its military training camps were evacuated. Fighters from the Jesh, we now know, were discreetly encouraged to turn their attention northward. The United Nations Security Council monitors reported in May 2022 that the Jesh was operating eight training camps in Afghanistan's Nangarhar under the Taliban's patronage. Kashmiri is believed to have been one of the many operatives sent by the Jesh leadership to Afghanistan, where he served several months in an American-run prison before being released after the fall of Kabul in 2021. For his efforts, General Bajwa sought political concessions from India on Kashmir. Among them, the restoration of the scrapped Article 35A of India's constitution, which gave the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir the right to designate permanent residents entitled to purchase land. There was little interest in New Delhi, though, to do any kind of political deal-making. Pakistan's flailing economy, strategists in India believed, prevented it from risking another crisis over Kashmir, which would damage its hopes of securing investments and normalizing its foreign exchange reserves. India also believed that the risk of being sanctioned by the multinational terror finance watchdog, the Financial Action Task Force, would restrain Islamabad. Facing resistance from his own core commanders over his India policy, Indian intelligence officials believe, and with no political concessions on the table, General Bajwa soon started lifting some of the restraints he placed on cross-line-of-control jihadist operations. The first significant jihadist attack after Pulwama, the execution of five sleeping soldiers at Chamreir, took place late in 2021. General Asim Munir, who took charge as army chief in November 2022, is thought to have authorized further jihadist operations leading up eventually to the Riyasi killings. 
Islamabad is basically now letting it be known that it doesn't think India has the stomach for war. Not in any case for incidents that fall short of spectacular attacks like the Pulwama bombing. The ISI knows that even as assembly elections draw closer, India is confronting renewed political challenges in Kashmir. The victory of secessionist politician Sheikh Abdul Rashid, campaigns claiming that India is threatening Islamic morals in Kashmir, and a snowballing row over an incident of alleged blasphemy in Srinagar, all these point to the persistence of unresolved conflicts and a bubbling secessionist impulse. Experience shows us that Islamabad isn't delusional. The communal killing which began in 1998 severely damaged the National Democratic Alliance government's nationalist credentials and compelled it to impose the Disturbed Areas Act across the generally peaceful region of Jammu. Thousands of Hindu refugees fled from their mountain villages, deepening communal strains and hardening the lines of division between Hindus and Muslims in Kashmir. Even though additional troops were pumped into the region, the killings continued until the military crisis of 2001-2002. Little imagination, of course, is needed to see why using jihadists to pressure India is a high-risk gamble. The gunshots that claim 10 lives could have easily cost many, many more. And a coalition government facing a future political crisis could easily be tempted to retaliate no matter what the consequences. Following the 1998 carnage in Riyasi, three crises, Kargil, the standoff of 2001, 2002 and Balakot, brought two nuclear powers to the edge of outright war. Last week's killings show both countries remain mired in a dangerous deadlock and both need to be aware that a fourth war might be closer than the leaders imagine. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm a contributing editor to the print. Thank you for watching this episode of Security Code.